you, Natalie, and thank you, the Greens. Uh, you can see, I think I'm giving away what I'll be talking about, which is credit. And uh, what I define credit as is the annual change in debt. So I'm going to explain the role that had in getting us into the problem we're in. And uh, I've just written a new a book of, uh, earlier, it came out earlier this year, I think in May, called uh, Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? It's more than one word long, uh, but not a lot. And in doing it, probably this is the most remarkable chart that I graphed because I was aware of the debt pattern for Australia, for America, um, a number of countries around the world. I hadn't seen the UK's debt chart until I put it together with data from the Bank of International Settlements plus data the Bank of England itself has done to backtrack on the level of private debt in the UK back to 1880. And I expected to see the same sort of pattern that was appeared in the American and Australian data of all the time a tendency to too much debt, a crisis, it gets written off somehow and then back again and back again. This is the UK's pattern. Do you notice something? <laughs> Two years after Maggie Thatcher gets elected. Yeah, and uh, we're on the downside of the roller coaster now. So, for a hundred years, including when England still called itself an empire with some justification, the level of private debt never exceeded 75% of GDP. Two years after Thatcher came in with the deregulation, particularly the housing market, it exploded. It went from 55% when she was elected to 190% at the peak there, and it's down to about 175% now. And that is fundamentally what's driven both the apparent economic performance of the last three decades and the actual crisis we've heard since, but it's ignored by conventional economists, it's ignored by conventional political parties. The Greens are the first party to invite me to actually talk about this topic. The blue line is the annual change in debt, which is credit, shown as percentage of GDP, and that's an essential part of a well-functioning capitalist economy is some demand from credit. But when it drives up debt levels as high as it gets, now you're in a trap and you've got to get out of it and really the only way out is it to write that debt off somehow. So I want to talk about that overall. Now, I was aware of the crisis being potentially what would happen in the future from a model I did, a very, very simple model uh, back in 1992. And it combines effectively three definitions. This is the crazy thing about when you do genuine dynamic modelling rather than the nonsense that passes for modelling in mainstream economics. You can actually work from definitions. So I took three definitions, the employment rate, the wage share of income and the debt ratio. And when you put them in dynamic terms, they're still definitions, but they now have a certain logic to them about what, what's going to cause change. If the economy grows faster than the sum of population growth and labour productivity growth, then the employment rate will rise. That's a fact, not a model yet. If wages rise faster than labour productivity, the wages share will also rise. That's another fact. And the debt ratio, private debt ratio, will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. That's a rather more obvious fact. But those are three facts. Put them together in the simplest possible model, of how those things relate to each other, and you get two possible outcomes. One is, if the debt ratio stabilises, then so will the economy. So this is a, a combination of graphs. The top level is the debt ratio, which in this very simple simulation is stabilising at about 75% of GDP, and the employment rate is going to stabilise over time. It takes a long time to get there, but it's heading towards stability, and so are income shares. If, on the other hand, the debt ratio continues rising, in that case it's hitting about 250% of GDP, then you get an apparent stabilisation. Things seem to be stabilising and then they get worse. Now that type of pattern is beyond mainstream economics because they model everything as additive. They, if something's going in a particular direction, it has to keep on going in that direction with the models they build. They don't understand how this sort of turnaround can happen. This is actually what happens in the real world, of course. Now, what they saw, and I hope there are some, I hope there are some any, any Rocky Horror fans in the audience? Yeah. Okay, I thought there might be here. I certainly am. Uh, what they saw was blue skies, because they simply forecast forward the trend of a decline in inflation and decline in unemployment, and they thought everything was going to be absolutely blissful. But in fact, it wasn't Frankenfurter who was charged anymore, it was Riff Raff, because the mission was a failure and the Great Recession came along shortly afterwards. So this trend for declining unemployment, which is the red line, becomes rising unemployment, 
and then you have this period of about five years where unemployment was stubbornly high before it finally started to fall. And of course, inflation, which is the thing that a, the bogeyman for economists is always the rate of inflation, and they saw it rising before the crisis, then it plunged, and then we head down to zero inflation. And the only thing that's pushed us up after that really is the impact of Brexit, pushing down, uh, pushing down the, the pound and then pushing up prices through the exchange rate effect. Um, so that's, that's, that's what happened, that's what they weren't expecting. But it's the real world. Now I was expecting it, and what I've been building on the work of Hyman Minsky in particular, and Irving Fisher before him, I see private debt as the main destabilising force in capitalism. It's ignored by mainstream economics. They completely leave private debt out of their thinking. Even if you read the most progressive of the mainstream, people like Joe Stiglitz, 10 years after the crisis, he's still talking about what might have caused it and what might be done to prevent it without once taking a look at the level of private debt. They have blinkers on their minds about its role. And if you look globally, this is the sort of picture you see globally. So in the case of Japan, which was the real canary in the coal mine, the first one to be fit by this process, and the UK, which is the blue line, and the American, which is the red line, they've hit a wall, maximum level of private debt, and it's then declined. And the decline in debt, which is a fall also in credit, is why demand has been so low, unemployment so stubbornly high, and why a decade of interest rates close to zero have barely lifted the economy off the floor. So people are talking about a return to normality in America, but they're still talking about interest rates that are effectively zero in real terms, actually less than zero. Countries that have got through the crisis appear not to have a problem, the ones like China. And they've got through the crisis by continuing to borrow private debt. Okay. They've simply put it off to later. They're going to have the crisis in the next couple of years. So that's the main destabilising force. What do you do about it? Well, first of all, you've got to realise this, and again, Mainstream economists and, of course, mainstream political parties, including, of course, the Tories, but also, to some extent, the Labor Party, though there is some awareness in the Labor Party. They don't talk about it, but they're aware of it in the background. Uh, there's been this huge rise in private debt, and it's a global phenomenon. And the rise in public debt came after this, unlike like a Band-Aid over a wound. Only the wound, I'll give you another reference, it's rather like a wound in the, uh, the Black Knight episode of Monty Python. Okay. <laughs> Band-aids don't work all that well. So the crisis begins when you have a high level of debt and then you have falling, uh, stabilising debt after that. It doesn't even take a fall in debt to cause a crisis. And I want to give you a, a simple numerical explanation of this because you can have a crisis even if debt continues growing if it slows down to the same rate of growth of the economy itself because total demand in the economy is the turnover of the money that's currently in your pocket and in your bank accounts, and plus the money that's added to it when people take out debt, because that actually creates new money, something the Bank of England was the first um, central bank to actually state publicly. That's what a conventional economists ignore. So imagine you're in an economy uh, which is a roughly, say, a trillion dollar a year economy, which is growing at about 10% per annum in nominal terms, and those are fairly realistic figures as an example, for before the crisis hit, and private debt being 50% of GDP. Now, that's the level we saw in the UK back before Maggie Thatcher got elected. Okay, so, again, it's historically relevant. But that debt's growing at 20% per annum. Now, again, there's a realistic ball, you know, sort of put your, finger, your thumb up and feel the, feel the wind levels. They're realistic ratios to look at. So if that's the case, if it's debt's growing at 20% per annum, Credit is adding an additional $100 billion per year to demand, which is 20% of the initial debt level. So you add the two together and you get total demand in the economy is $1.1 trillion in that particular year. Now, the year after, if GDP is still growing at the same nice stable rate, 10%, but the growth of debt slows down to being the same as the rate of growth of the economy, so the debt ratio stabilises, then you've got to $600 billion in debt, 10% of that is $60 billion. You add that to the $1.1 trillion, you get total demand of $1.16 trillion, which is $60 billion more than the year before. So you've still got growing GDP. It's, it, the total demand is growing still. It slowed down a bit, but it's still growing. That's why you can have ups and downs in debt back in the days when Britain had a 50% of GDP debt level without having serious crises. 
But you fast forward to today and you're looking at a debt level of close to 200% of GDP. Now, in that case, in this hypothetical example, that means debt's $2 trillion. And again, I'm looking at a growing 20% per annum, which again is quite realistic. Those are the levels we've seen. 20% of $2 trillion is $400 billion. So you add that to the $1 trillion, you've got a total amount of $1.4 trillion. Now, an economy doing that, superficially, looks like it's doing really well compared to the others. You might call it a, a Celtic tiger. Okay? Looks good compared to other economies that haven't got the same rate of debt rate growth. So next year we've got the same thing. GDP grows by 10%, so it's $1.1 trillion. Growth of debt slows down to 10%. Now, you've got to $2.4 trillion in debt, so 10% of that is $240 billion. You add that onto the $1.1 trillion, your total demand is $1.34. That is $60 billion less than the year before. So even stabilising the debt ratio causes a decline in total demand, and that's what catches us out. Okay? And, of course, what's actually happened is it's gone negative, so it's subtracted from demand. So both the level and the rate of growth of debt matter because of this little factor that income plus, roughly speaking, income plus change in debt. Truly speaking, money you've currently got plus new money being created by debt. But that's the basic idea. So what's the situation we got ourselves into? Now, I, I think I have to congratulate the Tories for probably the most effective political campaign in history in convincing not only the public but its opposition that government spending caused the crisis back in 2010. Congratulations. That's the greatest piece of spin, the best, best spin bowling in the history of British cricket. Now, um, so in that situation, then, then they convince us that austerity is the way to go. And it sounds sensible, even when a Maybot says it, uh, that you, know, uh, you, you must live within your means. And that's, that looks like a good idea to all of us, because it appeals to the household analogy we automatically fall into. If we're considering, you know, we're looking at our budget and we're not saving any money, we think, well, let's spend 10 pounds less than last year and save 10 pounds this year. And that looks sensible. And that's what we all extrapolate, including chancellors of the Exchequer, to say what the national economy should do. So you start with zero savings, you spend £10 less, you put away 10 for a rainy day. Great. Let's all try doing that. So I'm now going to add three more sectors of this economy, sectors A, B and C. They can be anything you like. They can be individuals, they can be the um, service sector, manufacturing, the government, they can be domestic, they international. It makes sense whichever way you put it together because your spending is somebody else's income. That's the profound insight that underlies all of macroeconomics. And if you don't understand that, you go totally wrong. And unfortunately, mainstream economics, because it ignores money, actually ignores that constraint. So the politicians are advised by people who don't understand money. It's no wonder they stuff up money. So let's look at it from sectors B and C's point of view. Sector A is now spending, in year zero, it spent 200, and it earned 200. In years one, it spends 190. That means it's spending $5 less or five pounds less on each of the other two sectors. So it's 10 pound savings causes a five pound deficit in the other two sectors. And when you look at the aggregate level of, of savings, there's been no increase in savings. You've simply reallocated who's got existing money. Sectors in B and C are now dissaving by the, five, by the 10 pounds in total that Sector A is savings by. Not because they're irresponsible, but because Sector A's savings caused that decline in their income. And then, of course, they'll cut their spending as well. So living with your means means spending less than you earn. But macroeconomics tells you they're identical. So if you keep on trying to spend less than you earn, where do you reckon you end up? Earning zero. Okay? That's, that's the course we've been put on by following austerity. Now, if you look at the, what happens if the other two sectors decide to do the same thing, well, they also decide to spend £10 less, which means the income of the other two sectors they're spending on is also £10 less, and your GDP falls from £600 billion in this example to £570 billion. You've gone backwards. Okay? You haven't saved any additional money. You can't it's just, this is the thing I want to get through the, to mac, people in macroeconomics and people to think about these issues. Macroeconomies can't save. Individuals can. The only way you can save, everybody can save, if it's somebody else is deliberately not saving. So but we're all trying to accumulate money. This is a general conclusion that even you know, radical people can agree with that that's what people try to do.
click on the link, we'll guess who the radical person was who said that particular statement, accumulate, accumulate, that is Moses and the prophets. So whole economies can't save unless there's some sector that is deliberately dissaving. Can there be a sector which always spends more than it earns? Military. So imagine, imagine that sector question mark. So we have sector question mark. I've now increased the spending of each sector by 20. They're spending 20 on sector question mark. And sector question mark is spending 30 on each of them. So sector question mark's total income is 60. Its total spending is 90. It's got a deficit of 30. And then because it has that deficit of 30, each of these other sectors can do what they're trying to do, which is save money. Okay? That's how you make it consistent. Now, what can sector question mark be? Well, it could be banks, because if banks lend more than they get back in repayments, that increases the amount of money in your bank accounts. There's only one problem. It also increases the amount of money you owe the banks. So you individually, if you borrow money, you're not better off in net terms. If you cause an asset price bubble with the money you borrow, you might do better out of that. But in the aggregate, you are no better off by that borrowing the money from the banks. Your increase in money is identically matched by an increase in what you owe the banks. Now, what if the government spends more than it takes back in taxation? That increases your bank accounts by 30, in this example. Now, it doesn't give the individual recipients an identical debt. Okay? The government's got an issue about funding that, but if you, if you receive a payment as a government contractor, that doesn't come with a debt back to the government again. Equally, a welfare payment doesn't come with an obligation to repay it, unless you're unfortunate to be in the UK these days, which seems to be the way the, the, government, the Tories are pushing welfare policy. But in general, the government creates an asset for you without creating a liability for you. But it has to finance it, and that's always the question. Where are we going to get the money? Where's the magic money tree? Okay. Well, the magic money tree is the government's own bank. There are two money trees in the, in the international economy. Banks that can create money by double entry bookkeeping, but they create debt for you at the same time. The government that can create it by spending more than it gets back in taxation and by financing that by selling bonds to its own bank. Now, legal rules stop them doing that directly. All these rules have been put in place by economists who don't understand money or by economists who are afraid that politicians might understand money. <laughs> God knows which one. Uh, but they indirectly do it anyway. When they do open market operations, the central banks are effectively doing what I'm showing by summarising in this table. So imagine that you've got that 30 now that the government needs to finance, and imagine that it's going to do it in a year and the interest rate is 10%, which of course is far higher than it is right now. Well, the government can issue bonds worth $33 billion, and by issuing those bonds, which is an asset uh, for the central... Uh, or selling those bonds to the central bank... The central bank's assets rise by 33. Its liabilities, which are the amount of money Treasury now has in its account, also rise by 33. The Treasury then spends that money on the public. That reduces the amount of money in the tre Treasury's account, increases the amount in the reserves of the banking sector. And then with three of what it's already borrowed by issuing the bonds, it can pay the central bank. And in that process, what it's actually done is increase the equity of the central bank. So rather than paying interest being a problem, in this case, it's actually increasing the apparent equity of the central bank. And what happens back at the private bank levels is, well, they get an injection of $30 billion in terms of extra reserves, and that goes straight into individuals' deposit accounts, which means that individuals can save that money. So there's no technical problem about the government spending more than it gets back in taxation when the government is issuing money issued in a currency that it creates, which is the situation the UK is in. It's not the situation of places like Greece. Okay? You turn, can't turn into Greece until you, unless you're stupid enough to join the Eurozone. And that's one piece of stupidity that the UK did not fall for. So rather than not being able to pay the interest, you're actually increasing the equity of your central bank by paying those bills. Now, what if the government does the opposite? What if, how come I'm doing a Theresa May here? My voice is starting to go. <laughs> Thank God there's no ticky tape behind me. <laughs> um, well, now what I've got the government doing is actually running a surplus. So it's, take, it's, it's taking in... Uh, spending 20 on each sector effectively, but only spending, was taking in 20 and spending 10 back. So it's getting a surplus of 30. That pushes the other sectors into deficit. Government attempting to run a surplus pushes you into a collective deficit. Some of you might go up, some of you might go down, but on the, on the total, 
a government surplus means a private sector deficit. Now, rather than helping you save, it actually makes it harder for you to save. In fact, it forces you further into the red. And what that often does is encourage the private sector to go and borrow money from the banks, which leads to private sector bubbles. In fact, the only time, the only two times in America's history that the government's run a sustained surplus in the 1920s before the Great Depression and in the 1990s before the Great Recession. So rather than being saving for a rainy day, which is the way it's put across, it's actually setting up a hurricane. So what to do? What can we do? Well, excessive private debt is the problem. The solution is reducing it, not government debt. That's not a, it's not an issue for a country issuing its own bond, issuing its own currency. So we have to reduce it. And again, just to remind you of how extreme that is. Okay. We've got to get from that huge position there back to the level we were before Margaret Thatcher took over. That's the mistake you have to reverse. Now, that's equivalent to about 150% of GDP. It's huge. Now, you don't have to do it in one go. I would totally advise against trying that because this is completely <laughs> experimental. But consider, consider what is actually done by the, by the government. QE was 200 billion pounds in the first year, which is of the order of one sixth or one seventh the size of the economy. So we've already done a giant experiment of this scale. And we've done it. And did, you, did any of you notice you were charged a QE tax? You weren't, were you? It didn't take taxpayers' money to do that. It simply took the, the government deciding to create that money. Okay? So QE gives us all sorts of reasons to be able to promote a policy like this. It's not as though it hasn't been done. It just hasn't been done properly. Now, we can't rely upon the private sector and normal QE getting us out of trouble. This is showing, the red line shows Japan's private debt to GDP ratio from 10 years before its crisis began in 1990 to today. And the blue line shows the UK from 10 years before the 2008 crisis to today. And I think you can pretty much say that if we stick with what Japan's been doing, we're going to end up in much the same situation, stagnating with a level of private debt between 160 and 150% of GDP, which is about three times what it should be for the economy to get back to a sustainable economic growth path. And what you can do is use exactly the same power that's been used for QE, for QE for the people. But to have that as a direct per capita injection into household bank accounts. Now, of course, we know what QE has done in terms of households. It's made the rich ones much better off. They're the ones who own shares right now. They've been beneficiaries on a grand scale of QE as it's been practiced for the last decade. So what I'm talking about is a policy to reverse that mistake as well as reversing the one beforehand of letting private debt rip. Have a direct per capita injection into household bank accounts. And those who have debt, and of course the banks know who they owe money to them, that money reduces their debt level. Those without debt get a cash injection. Now one of those scares is if you do that, you're gonna cause inflation, which for strange reason is, is only a scare when somebody proposes provides a way of working, doing that might actually work, because the central bank's been trying to cause it for the last decade. Um, you get a cash injection and use that to buy corporate shares, where those corporate shares must be used to reduce, corp used to reduce corporate debt. Now, if you do that, you democratise share ownership, you reverse the inequality effect of standard QE, you reduce the corporate debt level as well, you might actually enable British corporations to invest again, and you reverse the income inequality that we've already caused, courtesy, first of all, of letting the private debt bubble rip, and secondly, by QE since then. Now, if we don't do it, then the alternative is this continued stagnation. And again, I don't have to say this is hypothetical. I'll say, look at Japan. Now, I think Japan has got something in its favour that most of the rest of the West doesn't have, and that's a much more cohesive society which can cope with this level of stagnation and also declining population growth and a whole lot of other factors that mean it can cope. But if we don't do it here, what we're going to see is political turmoil. And, of course, mainly that means rejecting the so-called centre parties. Now, that might be something which could be to the advantage of the Greens. Thank you. Okay, well, I think there's a couple of bits of credit 
to give here. First of all, thank you very much to Steve for covering an enormous amount of ground because I gave him a challenge of doing that all in about 20 minutes and I think he did that. And I also want to give credit to everyone who stayed in this room because that was an incredibly dense and complicated <laughs> procedure. And I promise you, if this is your first conference, not every session is going to be quite like that. <laughs> However, I think what we've done is tackled there very quickly what I think is the huge issue of our time. So, Steve, just a couple of things to perhaps bring in more of a Green Party perspective to this. Yeah. Um, one of the things that many people in this room will know is that our policy is broadly following along with positive, po positive money, taking away money creation from the private banks mm. and giving it to the government. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that specifically. And also, I suppose the question is perhaps bringing in the, the environmental perspective. Yeah. And, of course, the aspect that we come for our unconventional economics from a different perspective and saying you can't have infinite growth on a finite yeah. planet, but yeah. we have to get away from growth. So perhaps if you could just comment on the positive money side and also yeah. growth okay. and where we go with that. I'm on Positive Money's advisory board. And I have a lot of time for the organisation for two reasons. One, I, I generally support what they're pushing for, but I also like the fact that they're so open they can ask somebody who's a critic to some extent, which I am, to be on their advisory board. So, you know, a lot of time for positive money. I'm in favour of more government money creation than private money creation. But I still think there's a role for private money creation, but it has to be channelled. At the moment, something like about 90% of the money the private sector creates finances property speculation. Okay. It doesn't finance actual production. It dribbles into the real economy uh, via the faucet of rising house prices and rising stock prices financed by rising leverage. Uh, what you really need is the private sector to do what the public sector is very bad at, and that's take risks on entrepreneurs. Okay. And I have had plenty of experience of bureaucrats stuffing up entrepreneurs, and I don't trust a uh, government committee to do, make decisions about that. I do trust them to make decisions about infrastructure spending and things of that nature, and then finance and education and health and so on, and finance setting up systems for that. But the private sector has a role in a sort of venture capitalist way. So I'd want to have some private money creation, but prevent them being able to do that for property bubbles and collateralised lending, require that they've got to do it for either working capital for firms or funding for entrepreneurs where they might take an equity position rather than taking a debt position. So there's another book I'm recommending, my book here, of course, but I'd also recommend a guy called Andy McNally has a book called Debt on ATA. And Andy actually ran a major uh, a boutique bank, <coughs> a bit of a contradiction in terms, but a fairly large uh, uh, investment bank. And he's now become uh, as an e a investor in a company called Equitain, and they're trying to develop equity-based finance for firms. And Detonator gives a very good insider's perspective on what's dangerous about debt as opposed to equity positions in creating money. So I do see a role, a combined role. Also, if you block the financial sector out completely, what are they going to do? Spend every last cent they've got undermining you. Okay? I want to at least partly neutralise that by saying, well, okay, you can produce, create money, so long as you make bloody well think about it in future rather than simply pumping up asset bubbles, which is what they've done. Uh, on the ecological front, a major I, I read The Limits to Growth in 1972. The copy I've got of that book is the most, most thumb, thumb book in my entire library. And I see that as incredibly wise, and it was destroyed by economists because economists couldn't understand the whole idea of something not reaching equilibrium. So we have to then realise that uh, we live in a, on, a, on a finite planet, and we've, not only have we uh, live on a finite planet, we've exceeded the finite boundaries. I'm sure most people here would be aware of a thing called the human ecological footprint. Okay. That shows in the sort of acres per country or hectares per country how much land is being used to produce the current level of output. UK is using about five times as many acres as it currently has. Of course we're going to strain the planet and at some stage we're going to have to get involved in super-industrial level attempts to reduce the damage we've already done. I think it goes well beyond the idea of trying to get back to sustainable consumption now. We're so far past that, it's ridiculous. So we have to be aware of that, and that makes me a fan of some pretty out there concepts in how we get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But that, to me, understanding that in the first instance, and I've been doing a lot of work on um, showing economists how energy is essential for production, and therefore energy creates additional waste that necessarily burdens the planet. Uh, we, unless we get an economic theory that's aware of that as well of debt, 
we're cactus. Just following on from that, I wonder if you have any thoughts on donut economics. Which? Donut economics, Kate. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm going to have to persuade Kate to change the terminology because donut, who does that mean, remind you of? Sensible, responsible, Homer Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> And at, at the same time, there's people talking about what they call the, the circular economy. Now, they're both in the right direction, but they don't quite get the analogy right because a circle does not turn. Okay? Oh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm producing what I call the wheel economy. Okay? Think about a wheel. There's an internal section. You don't want to be running on your hub. You don't want to be on, on the rubber. You don't want to be outside it. But a wheel only turns if you push it. So a wheel economy, that's what I'm going to try to persuade Kate to go to rather than donut a wheel. But the basic idea, all the constraints we have, you don't want to be inside the hub because you're un under-resourced, you're malnourished, uh, we, you know, we can't be artistic. Outside the wheel, we're destroying the planet's capabilities. We have to be within the wheel, but the wheel gets pushed. And that's the energy use we take from the sun, which includes fossil fuels, of course, with a slight time lag of about 50 million years. Uh, and that's that's our real problem. We've got to get back to the stage where we're inside the wheel. Okay, just two more questions from me, and now I'm going to throw it open to the floor, and we'll have a roving mic. So if you want to think about what questions you want to ask, but just two more things to raise in terms of the issue of house prices mm. and how utterly dependent the British economy is on that, and how people's individual economies and households are dependent on those house prices. Yeah. And also, you know, at the moment we're seeing in a global sense of specialising in the finance sector in quote unquote financial services. Mm. What does Britain do instead and what does our economy look like? Yeah, well, house prices have been driven up by mortgage debt. It's, it's, I'm doing some empirical work, which I, I haven't uh, had a chance to finish writing the paper, but um, Paul Omer and I and, and an econometrician, uh, Ricard, showed that what actually causes rising house prices is rising mortgage credit which is the annual change in new mortgages. So fundamentally what caused the bubble was letting the, letting the, the uh, banking sector lend so much for housing. Well, duh, okay? <laughs> it should be obvious, but it, you know, the econom economists totally ignore that role and just rely on the look on the supply side. So if we get the finance sector out of causing property bubbles by mortgage lending, we'll drop house prices dramatically. Of course, there are a lot of people who won't be happy about that, as well as many who are, which is one reason I talk about the idea of a modern debt jubilee linking um, creation of that money with creation of share equity that people then get distributed through society, which will attenuate the decline in the value of housing. So I think that's essential to do that. We have to stop thinking about houses as investments and start thinking of them as consumption items, places we live in, not places we sell, we flip to each other and make a profit out of. You only make a profit out of houses if you can sell your children. Okay. <laughs> I can see some people considering that. <laughs> you better remind me of the other one. Uh, that, what, what, how might the UK economy look if okay. you were doing financial services? Yeah, I mean, financial services was a total, furf, a total delusion because most of so-called financial services are selling debt to people. That worked well when it was expanding, but of course it had a use-by date, and the use-by date was 2008. So you have to re-industrialise in many ways. You've got to bring manufacturing back into this country. Partly the devaluation that's occurred with the pound makes that slightly feasible. But you need an industrial policy, an investment policy. And the UK has tried to live without that for the last three decades. And in that process, you've gone from manufacturing being about 20% of GDP to about 10. Now, at the same time, Germany has gone from about 23% of GDP to about 23% of GDP. So fundamentally, you've, you've, you've argued the services can replace manufacturing. No, they can't, not just in terms of employment, but also in terms of actual generation of a profit. Uh, ultimately, services are trivial. The real stuff is manufacturing. Okay, so that's some questions from me and a bit of a framework from me. So now I'm going to throw it open to the floor. We have a kind volunteer who I, who I gave the microphone to and said you're going to be the roaming mic man. Um, so if you can please wait for the microphone. Uh, I can already see, I'm going to come to the hands that I can see, but I can already see that it would appear that um, every person who has their hand up at the moment would probably identify as male without making any assumptions. So um, I will be looking to balance that up at some stage. To start off with, I'll go to the green shirt in front of you. 
And if you also give your name and local party with the question, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, John Essex, uh, East Side Green Party. And, and thank you, although I, I picked up some of it, I must have, I got lost a few times along the way. Um, things I picked up was that um, austerity effectively redistributed money through QE to the rich away from everyone else. Um, we need to push start the economy and drive it like a wheel, and we need to reindustrialise. Um, but normally when we grow the economy in the UK, we do it by building infrastructure, which is something that capitalists do to make money for themselves. So how do you square that circle, and um, does jobs feature? I'm sorry, I missed the last part of that question. How does, so that's the reindustrialisation. Um, what does that look like in terms of equity? Because the process of industrialisation historically has been one where capitalists make money for themselves and increase inequality. Whereas I guess we want yeah. to um, deal with climate change, but also increase inequality. That, or decrease. That, that's, that's one reason I talk about the idea of, of using a people's QE to democratise share ownership. But the, the level of inequality that's been created by current QE is massive. You've pretty much tripled share prices since they started, well, certainly double share prices since QE began. It's all gone to people who currently own shares. And they'll make song and dance about people owning it through pension funds, but fundamentally it's the wealthy who benefited out of that. So you've got a really strong argument saying you've biased it in favour of the rich. Now let's even things out by biasing in favour of every, the poor by doing a per capita distribution of share ownership. So partly that jubilee share idea is directed at that particular point. Okay, so what, I think there was a question in there about in terms of if you're going to rebuild manufacturing. Mm. Uh, do, I mean, that's, that's not easy, by a long shot. Okay, uh, You've got to, you've really, by financing on fi so-called financial engineering, you've drastically reduced the capacity of the country to do real engineering. So you really have got a very hard struggle there. In some ways, it's a bit like Japan was after the Second World War. And they made the sensible uh, move of importing a guy called Deming, who was an American academic uh, man management consultant who focused on how to make manufacturing more efficient. And because the Americans thought they were hot shit, they ignored him. So he went to Japan, and over a 15-year period, he went from Japan being the vehicles you laugh at to Japan being the vehicles you aspire to or maybe 25 years, but it's not easy. But of course, what's coming up at the moment in terms of the ecological threat the planet faces is an enormous reason to say, let's start industrialising around reducing the carbon we've pumped into the atmosphere thus far. So there are, there are prospects, but I'm, I'm never going to say that it's easy to do, but you've done the wrong thing at some stage, you've got to start trying the right thing. Okay, the title would be popped into my mind. Uh, the gentleman here in the green shirt, I think in the middle, um, you yeah, pass across, yep. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so, uh, Lee Barker, North of Forest and Redbridge Street, Green Party. Sorry, I've got a bit of a cold. Um, so, um, I was just thinking about the idea of a citizen's income. I don't know if you know about that idea, universal basic income. It's Green Party policy and it's guaranteed income for every citizen. I just wonder how you see that, you know, do you see a role for that in, in the economy? I'm afraid my hearing is a bit challenged, so can you try that again? Universal basic income. Oh, okay. Um, there's a, there's a, two arguments that people are putting forward about how to um, prevent downturns by providing income to everybody. One is a job guarantee, the other is universal basic income. I'm in favour of both, but overall, in the long term, I'm more in favour of a universal basic income. And the basic reason for that is that the amount of people who actually do productive work in the economy has plunged dramatically. Only about 10% of the population actually produces anything these days. The other 90% of us are involved in what David Graeber has brilliantly termed bullshit jobs. <laughs> now, I'm not particularly in favour of bullshit, so I'd rather say universal basic income and let people party rather than you know, wasting their time doing um, <laughs> useless jobs and calling it a job guarantee. That puts me on the other side to a lot of people in modern monetary theory, uh, but I think both are, are necessary ways to start. And if once we see that the vast majority of what we produce is not produced by labour, it's produced by machines that workers currently manage, but as time's going on, less and less workers are needed to do that management particularly with AI coming along and with far more, far more machine controlled systems and so on. So we, if we could pretend that labour is the source of output, we're going to find at some pace we're losing the political 
a power struggle with capitalists. Because in many ways, the only reason we've been paid wages for the last two centuries is it's blackmail. If you want that machine to be turned on, you've got to pay me to hit the switch. Okay? Uh, that, that blackmail source is disappearing at the moment, and when it does, the political power of the labour movement declines dramatically, and it's already pretty bad. So I'd rather get a universal basic income, something we organise through our parliamentary systems, and then distribute the wealth we create, mainly by exploiting energy via the use of machines. Um, yeah. Can we get away from green? That's three in a row. Hi, Valerie Brilliant Shaw, Chisholm from Golden Green Party. I'm going to try and sneak in two questions because I think the first question might be a one word answer. The first question is your theory of quantitative easing for people, has it been practiced? Do we have any examples? Yes, that's a good question, and yes, it has. The first time it was done was in my home country of Australia. It was done two weeks after I went on national TV and scared the bejesus out of our then Prime Minister, <laughs> who was interviewed the day after me on the same program. And uh, what it was was a, they called it a tax rebate, and they gave $1,000 to everybody who'd paid their tax that year. Okay? Now, that came out of nowhere. It was simply a government accounting operation. That's all it really comes down to. Now, there are a lot of other stupid things done by Australia, which stupid things which work, like starting a property bubble again. Okay, that's what kept the economy ticking over. But that, that $1,000 in was spent by most people. So that $100,000 $100, in, about 800 was spent almost straight away. And that gave you a boost to demand that meant the economy didn't go into a technical recession. So it has been done. And then? Didn't, if, if, uh, if it was successful, didn't it carry on? No, it wasn't carried. It's was only done. It's only done once, and then and then never done again. And of course, it was then criticised by the opponents as causing the crisis. Mm -hmm. Almost the same bullshit that you fell for here. So, unfortunately, um, I, I, you can tell Natalie and I share a nationality. Our origins. Yeah. That 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 process could have been continued. All you have to do is realise that the government is not spending your money when it spends more than it gets back in taxation. It's creating your money. Okay. My other quickie is, this might not be so quick, but Corbyn in his speech at party conference is talking about the end of capitalism. Um, what's, I was thinking, yeah, great, capitalism needs to end, we need no growth. What's your view on that? Um, I regard capitalism as the second most effective society humanity's ever had in inspiring innovation. The most successful being Cro-Magnon society before we got organised beyond tribes of 150. Okay? Um, and that's the positive side of capitalism. The negative side is, as one of my next door neighbours once said, capitalism is all about, he was a capitalist of course, uh, capitalism is all about socialising your losses and privatising your profits. And, of course, that's what's happened with the ecological side of the system, that we've dumped all this waste into the planet and not accounted for it. We can't completely account for it, by the way, because if we did, there'd be negative profit, according to the laws of thermodynamics. But we have to manage it. We have to constrain it. And capitalism only works on a planet the size of Jupiter. Now, because we're on a bit smaller planet, we've reached its bounds. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily going to die. I think... When you're looking at what's happening, and this, this is going to sound rather space cadet, but I'm not afraid about sounding that way. What's happening, people like Elon Musk and co with attempts to get off planet, uh, that is potentially our future. Okay? Now, capitalism may well survive uh, off the planet, but the planet won't survive with capitalism alone on it. So we have to reach that compromise. Whether we'll do it or not, I really don't know. This is proof that you get the really big ideas at Green Party Conference. I, I, I think, I think, the, um, I think the, the, the microphone runner has just put in the hand up, so you can ask a question. That's very kind of you. Um, my name is Leslie Rowe, I'm from Richmond Green Party. Uh, can I just say that the house prices are still a little deep, but it's gone down for the last 10 years. They're not going to Good. Um, my question is actually your example, and again, I, my knowledge isn't that great, but it seems to be a closed system. You were talking about one, one system affecting another. Um, and I'd like to just focus on the UK alone. We have a massive trade debt, yeah. which is uh, mainly financed by private debt. Well, you know, we're importing things that we don't need. Now, where in your equation do, do we actually uh, 
deal with the trade deficit yeah. for the UK, which in my view is unsustainable? Okay, there are, I said there are two ways in a national economy. There's three ways in a global, and that is you can create money by banks lending out more than they get back in repayments, by the government spending more than it gets back in taxation, and by you exporting more than you import, okay, running a current account surplus. Now, of course, the UK is running a current account deficit. What you're effectively doing is using 5% of the, Britain's GDP each year to produce money for other countries, especially Germany and China and Japan. So it's really important to try to achieve at the international level balanced trade but it actually advantages those who run a trade surplus to do so. Now economic theory actually says that people running a trade surplus will suffer rampant inflation and I'll give you examples of countries that are suffering rampant inflation right now and have for the last 40 years. Japan, Germany and China. How on earth do they still think it causes inflation by running with candleless policies? when those are the countries with the lowest rates of inflation for the last 40 years, not the highest. So economic theory is upside down about reality, but the reality is the mercantilist policy works because you basically get other people's money to help you run your own economy and invest. For that reason, Germany is one of the very few countries that's had falling government debt and falling private debt. It's because it's running a trade surplus of about 10% of GDP. So we have to prevent that. The trouble is, of course, that involves action not just in the UK's bounds, but internationally. And it's a large reason why the euro has been so beneficial to Germany, because without the euro, the mark would be worth 30% more, and its trade surplus would be a damn sight smaller. Okay. Um, in the front row, here, glasses on the top of here. Yep. Yeah. Um, I just picking up on the logic sitting here, and I may have gone completely off piece with this, but um, so one way of getting out of both the environmental and economic crisis may be a industrial process to take out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, produce something useful with it, uh, using energy that doesn't create more carbon dioxide. Yep, I, I completely agree with that. Wow. Okay. Uh, and the question is, how do you do it? Because a lot of what's been sold to us is this crap about clean coal. Now, that's like, that's like a sober Australian. I'm sorry, it's an ox. <laughs> doesn't happen. Um, what you actually can do, though, is exactly what you're talking about. I don't know how many of you saw Elon Musk's presentation in Adelaide last week talking about getting... Um, getting colonising Mars. But part of that said he's going to use, I've forgotten the name of the actual process, but it takes, uh, wa it takes water and carbon dioxide, combines them to produce oxygen plus methane. And that's what he's going to use to get the rockets back from Mars. Now, I wouldn't be the least bit amazed if he's also thinking that's what I'm going to do on an industrial scale on Earth, to take excess carbon dioxide, to take water, ultimately to get it out of asteroids because we don't want to run out on the planet, produce methane with it and oxygen and use that as rocket fuel that's then used for interplanetary exploration. Now, again, that sounds totally, I know, space cadet style, but it's actually being done right now. So I think it is possible to consider doing that. And then, of course, that involves a huge amount of government spending. Now, the, the, I don't expect us to do... By the way, I'm going to be cynical here, which, again, is amazing for an Australian. Um, and that is that I don't expect us to get out of this crisis deliberately. We didn't get out of the last one deliberately. If you take a look at that chart, I'll see if I can page back to it, the, the UK's level of private debt. If I can just page back here and show you again. Why is my page here not responding? Hang on. OK. There's the biggest dip in private debt in the UK's history, and that happens to be the Second World War. And the reason the debt level dipped was nobody asked, nobody said in Parliament, we can't afford that extra bomb. We can't afford that extra spitfire. So the budget deficit in the first year, the whole year was 40% of GDP. Now with that 40% of GDP debt, of course the private sector received that money, both workers and, and capitalists, the capitalists to build the spitfires, the workers to, 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 to man them and to make the equipment and so on. And with nothing to spend on, private debt was reduced to the lowest level in so far in recorded history for the UK which is why you had a relative boom in the 50s and 60s. So I think the same sort of existential threat will occur, courtesy of climate change. We'll, nobody will ask where's the money coming from. It'll just be spent. 
And in that process, we will, as well as hopefully addressing the ecological crisis, will also, by accident, get out of the debt crisis. I'd rather be more sensible than that, but that's what I think we'll end up doing. Well, that's a very good piece of news. Now, I saw in the middle here in the glasses the curly hair about halfway back. Um, orange scarf, we'll jump off that quite see from this angle. <laughs> sorry, I'm from James Brighton. Um, you were talking about the... Uh, so you speak up a bit, sorry? Yeah. You were talking about the per capita uh, cash injection, or yeah. per capita uh, cash distribution, which should be used to buy shares. Um, how would you avoid the problem of those shares in turn being bought up by people who are much more used to dealing in shares? Um, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, they tried this in Russia uh, after the end of the Soviet Union when they basically distributed vouchers to everybody. And what kept, what happened was you'd get these big funds who'd come in and buy the vouchers up and then the whole thing perpetuated. So yeah. it actually wasn't the normal... Large, largely, I'd do that through um, a form of superannuation system. So when you're buying the shares, it goes into yeah, a superannuation fund. A pension system. A pension a pension system. system. And you get dividends from that, but the you know the shares have to stay in the in the fund for some set period of time. So, But you, you're quite right. All those sorts of things are a real danger, and if you don't think about them, you'll get shafted by them later. So you have to take those issues into account. Okay, right at the back, standing up at the back, yeah. Jan Gerland Singh, Chancellor and Greg Wood Group, Green Party Group, Lessig Girl. May I, ask, may I say that I understand you to say lending money for mortgages creates housing shortages which will increase the prices. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, but my theory is, and tell me if I'm wrong, if more not for sale, I specify that, not for sale, council houses are built and rented at a much lower rate, or according, rented to how much the tenant income is, for example, Will that bring down the house? The price. Will that bring down the price of privately owned properties? Yeah, I think that will. I mean, again, I've criticised Germany a lot of the time, but Germany's uh, policies on rental income and rental properties is some of the thing I think we should try to emulate. Because in uh, in Germany's case, this is I still find this quite ridiculous each time I say it, but I know it's true now. And that is that in German rental contracts, the, the, the tenant is expected to supply the kitchen. That gives you an idea of the level of permanence and rights the tenants have in Germany versus what they have here. And what that means is that people tend to rent for long periods of time. They can't be kicked out by somebody who wants to flip the property. It's much, much harder to start a property bubble in Germany than it is anywhere else in the world. Now, actually, I expect the supposed exit of uh, British financial firms or firms currently based in Britain to Frankfurt may well undermine Germany on that front because they want, they want to change those laws to enable property bubbles to happen. But fundamentally, more rights to tenants and more provision of social housing and so on is definitely part of the mix. I'm actually a private owner of a house, though. <laughs> and I don't Good. Okay, credit there. Uh, here in the middle, middle, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, this comment. In 2010, I was invited by the government of China to China uh, because of my activities in the community. Speak up. Yeah. Yeah. In Europe, and I come from Kenya, from London, and they had me back in 2011. I went a lot. Uh, Passionate to what you just said, not in my hands. First time in my life, I feel first class when I live for weeks without spending a penny out of my own pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it happened back in 2011. Now, I flew to Peking, uh, and then I had another flight to Hangzhou, which is another 20 people that flight inside China. Now, uh, I was taking once to a community meeting, and at this meeting, the subject was small businessmen requesting help from the government. They say, 
the corporate taxes them on profits. They don't find that. But sometimes they make losses. What does it, would be what can the government do about this? I'll repeat the question. I heard it. Okay, yeah. if I'm getting this right, you're basically saying um, the issue of, of taxation, of taxing right. profits, yeah. but and it's it's and what happens with losses and how companies use losses to write off profits. So yeah. is it basically a question about tax avoidance? Yeah. Tax evasion? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Now, it was then shut down by the Austrian Central Bank after a while, but it did work on a regional basis, but they had to create their own parallel currency to do it. Okay. Here in the middle, in the blue um, shirt, yep, yep, and, and the brown jacket, cardigan. This description of wardrobes is really challenging. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Mr. Arthur Phillips from Noble to be here. Um, I can understand what's being said for the past person or two about it's actually local exchange trading schemes. And um, I've got a couple of documents here. I would like to just keep this fairly short. I've got to go after this yeah. question, by the way, so yes. it has to be short. Yes, yes indeed. Um, in the early days of banking, the pound note was a token representing a pound weight in the um, bank's vaults. Today, it is little more than numbers in computers playing a great game of real life monopoly. I've got here a couple of documents which I would like to hand over to our seniors for consideration at the next. I, 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 think, I think you better get to I've got to leave to go to do another meeting, so I've got to go. Let's, let's take one more question. One more question, I've got to go. One more question. Oh, okay, over there in the black um, jumper, skirt, whatever, <laughs> the black thing. <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm, I'm going to have to rush up. No, don't worry, I can't talk to you now. Sure, I've got to go. Okay. Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Catherine Porter. I'm from The Spectator. Um, I'm very interested in this quantity of easing for the people, what you said about the injection of household bank accounts uh, being then used to buy corporate shares. I think you then said that the corporate shares were then used to reduce the corporate debt. Mm. And when this was done in Australia with a $1,000 tax rebate, it said $800 was pretty much spent straight away. I'm assuming there was no restriction on how that yeah. rebate was spent. Is there any way that's done it and actually enforced it in the way you would like to see it? No, no, not so far. Which I'd, I'd rather do this on a trial basis, first of all. Yeah. You could try people's, people's QE at 1% of the level of actual QE and see what happened. Um, okay. So you don't have to do it on a grand scale. And you do have to test these things before you try them out. Uh, I think that's one of the mistakes of mainstream economics. They believe they understood the real world and they tried it out on the real world and they didn't have a clue how it functioned, so it made the system worse. I don't intend repeating that mistake, even if I'm more correct about how the real world actually operates. Okay, I think that, and uh, of course, universal credit is another example.